1912, uh, there was a missionary by the name of Dr. William Leslie that felt called to give his life to sharing the gospel and discipling unreached tribes in a remote part of the Congo. He remained faithful to this work for 17 years, but he felt like he was having very little impact. And so one day he had a major dispute with one of the tribal leaders and they asked him to leave and not come back. And so he left there a defeated man thinking he was a failure. And nine years later, he died. In 2010, about 80 years later, a missions organization made a shocking discovery. They found a network of reproducing churches hidden like little flaming fires in the dense jungle of the Congo where Dr. Leslie was stationed. And they reported that in each village they visited, they found a church. And in one of the villages, they found a thousand seat cathedral. And so by all known accounts, it's believed that Dr. William Leslie left the Congo discouraged and he died disappointed in his ministry efforts. But what he couldn't see is how much more committed God was to the work than he was. And so today we're going to look at two disciples that also seem discouraged and disappointed about what they believe Jesus came to accomplish. And um, if you read the Easter passages uh, in the scriptures, if you read all of the, the stories that surround Jesus' journey to the cross, as he's headed to the cross, the closer he gets to the cross, what you see is the more discouraged and disappointed his followers are. His best friends, his followers, these, I mean, think about it, these were all people who thought they were going to be in his cabinet, right? They thought this brother was going to take over, and they knew they were going to be in his entourage. And as he got closer and closer to the cross, they began to understand, oh, shoot, this is not what I thought it was. And so all around Jesus, towards the end of his life, are discouraged, disappointed people. Aaron did a great job last week taking us through the triumphal entry because what we saw there is as Jesus came into the city and he's riding a colt, all the people in the city were celebrating, weren't they? They were singing songs. They were laying palm branches out. For them, it was victory time. It was go time. Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord is what they sang. You didn't want me to sing it, I promise. They were singing and singing and celebrating. But at the end of the week, the very same people who sang those songs were the ones, and you know this, they were the ones who were saying what? Crucify him. There are discouraged people all around Jesus as he approaches the cross. And in Luke 24, Jesus has been hung on a cross and killed. Now, many had come before him claiming to be Israel's redeemer. He wasn't the first one to do this, but Jesus was so believable, you know? When he spoke to you, you felt like he really knew you. He cared. He loved. He taught with authority. It was as if he really knew Adonai. He knew what people were thinking. He didn't just value those in power. But, but he would care for and see the poor. He healed people. He even rose people from the dead. But now, he's dead. And what's crazier is his body is missing. And so in this chapter, we meet two of his followers who are uh, just bummed out trying to make sense of all that's happening. And then this mysterious man comes alongside them and starts walking with them, and he asks them questions. Amen? So Luke 24, starting in verse 13, it says, Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened, and as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, 
Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? He asked. I love how Jesus always acts like he doesn't know what's going on. <laughs> what? Some, something happened? <laughs> About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what's more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and they told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and they found it just as the woman had said, but we did not, they did not see Jesus. Now, this walk to Emmaus is famous, and our appreciation for this story may deepen when we consider that Luke was believed to have had many, many eyewitness accounts and testimonies of Jesus' resurrection, yet he only recorded a few. In his gospel account, he only records a few. He gives us Mary Magdalene's account at the tomb. He gives us the 11 disciples in a room. He gives us Jesus's ascension, and then he gives us this story, right? So there must be something about this story that gives us everything we need to believe, right? Everything we need to believe. And so the journey to Emmaus is a road that we must all travel. It is both a literal and spiritual journey where Jesus opens our eyes to see him for who he is and shows us how we can come to know him. All right, and this is what I want to go after today. And let me just let me just say, uh, my approach to preaching is changing a little bit. Uh, if you've if you've heard me preach, you know I come up here. I'll have an intro, three points, and a gospel presentation. All right, but God has been stirring me lately to begin to ask God, what do you want to do in the room? And so as I've been praying for this moment, standing before you, I've been asking God, God, what do you want to go after? And I believe this is it. All right, I believe this is it, that if you are here today and you are a discouraged, disappointed believer, or if you're here today and you would confess that you have had an allergy towards God, towards church, towards organized religion, that you have strong opinions about God and you really just don't believe him to be as good as everyone hypes them up to be. I would ask you to consider that you just may be like these disciples on the road to Emmaus, because what we're gonna find as we continue to read on here is they had a flawed view of who Jesus was and what he came to do. They had a a flawed view of it. And so if you're open to letting Jesus speak for himself, you can at the very least walk out of here with an informed decision. Is that fair? Is that fair? Matter of fact, raise your hand if you, if you enjoy being misunderstood. Just raise your hand, okay? If you, if you like it when people get you wrong, okay? I actually believe you. I believe you. All right. And so Jesus comes walking alongside these disciples as they are verbally processing everything that's going on, and they don't know it's him. All right. They don't know. They have misconceptions about who Jesus was and what he came to do. And in a moment that should be filled with great joy and great uh, hope and power and boldness, they have none of those things. Have you been there? Jesus, in this one conversation, makes a comment. He asks a question and he gives an explanation. And out of this, we will get our three points for today. Because if you want to see Jesus as he truly is, you need to know something about his service, about his suffering, and about his strength. Amen? Ready to look at this with me? One yes. Um, Amazing. Listen, I know you're into the the barbecue you're going to have later. So am I. Okay, my mom made two German chocolate cakes. I'm in a rush like you're in a rush. All right. All right. All right, first, his service. 
these two disciples were trying to explain Jesus to this mysterious man who's really Jesus, and this is what they said. They said, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people, but the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. Here's the key. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. See, they thought that Jesus came as a king to redeem Israel from Roman occupation, but he actually came as a servant to do so much more. And here comes Jesus' comment. This is what Jesus says. He says, hmm, how foolish. How foolish you are and how slow you are to believe all the prophets have spoken. See, if we were to look at everything the Old Testament prophets said about the mission of the coming Messiah, I could show you how they were talking about someone who would come and do far more than deliver this nation, this small nation from an ungodly empire, right? But I think one prophet will do enough. I'll just give you Elijah, or excuse me, Isaiah, all right? Uh, in the last chapters of the book of Isaiah, we get to, the, to what the scholars and comment, uh, commentators call the servant songs. And there's four of these songs. And in them, this mysterious figure called the servant of the Lord is prophesied. And we're told in this prophecy that he is going to bring salvation into the world. All right, listen to Isaiah 49.6. It says, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. It's a lot bigger vision, right, than just a small nation under Roman occupation. The vision of the Messiah was always meant to extend salvation to the whole world, and the means by which it would happen would be through the mystery of servanthood, right? Uh, one New Testament scholar said that Jesus's campaign against evil is waged in a mysterious way that no one could have expected culminating in the cross. See, Jesus didn't come with an army and swords to win back a plot of land. No, he came teaching, healing, doing good. Jesus used his power to serve people and was so effective, it was so compelling, it was so positively disruptive that they killed him over it. Jesus spends his three-year ministry serving people. And at the end of it, he brings all of his disciples into a room. And they're having their last supper, it's famously known as, right? He brings all of them in the room. You know what he does first before they sit down and eat? He takes a towel, wraps it around his waist, he gets on his knees, and he washes their feet. Minutes later, Minutes later, an argument breaks out in the room because the disciples are talking amongst each other about who's the greatest. And Jesus has to check them in a the moment and say, hey, I am among you as one who serves. Hours later, one of his friends in that very room betray him. And he's killed. He's hung on a cross and killed. And the next time some of these disciples see him, do you know what he's doing? He's cooking breakfast for them on the beach. The next time they see him after this, he's cooking breakfast. And this is the funniest scene, all right? If you read the Bible and you don't get the humor, you're not reading hard enough, okay? <laughs> so looking at the end of the book of John, there's this scene where Jesus is on the beach and he's making, he's cooking fish for all the guys and they come and they show up and they're sitting around in a circle and they know dang well, they just saw this guy beat and hung and killed and he's sitting there serving them like nothing ever happened. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> Why was Jesus doing this? Can I tell you why Jesus was doing this? Because Jesus was not just a servant so that he can go to the cross. Jesus is a servant forever. He's a servant forever, guys. Matter of fact, you know what Jesus is doing right now? According to the scriptures, he's actually working on our behalf. He's preparing a place for us. Right? He's interceding for us. He's advocating for us before the Father. 
for the Father. Amen? Jesus said to these disciples, how foolish you are. The prophets are trying to tell you, but you didn't believe him. See, if you want to see Jesus as he truly is, you have to see him as a servant. Amen? Secondly is suffering. Uh, Jesus makes a comment, how foolish you are and slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. But then he asks a question. This is what he says. He says, did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? Suffering was always part of the deal. It was always a part of the deal. Another one of the servant songs, Isaiah says this, says, see, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see, and what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of the ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Uh, many of us know who Jordan Peterson is. Uh, Jordan Peterson is a Canadian author and psychologist, uh, and I love how he sums up the suffering of Jesus. He says this. He says, you cannot write a more tragic story. It's impossible. Why? Because it's the aggregation of everything that people are afraid of. There was no death more painful than crucifixion. That's why the Romans invented it. They wanted to punish political miscreants. It was a slow, agonizing death by suffocation and dehydration and exposure, extraordinarily painful. Okay, so that sucks. I mean, that's pain, man. Plus, he knows it's coming, and that's kind of part of his story. Plus, your best friend betray betrayed you into it. Plus, your people turn against you. Plus, they're led by a tyrant who doubts truth. Plus, you're a victim of the Roman Empire. Plus, you're completely innocent. Plus, everybody knows it. Plus, they choose a criminal to be released from this experience instead of you, even though they know he's a criminal and they know you're innocent. And you're young. And you've done no wrong. And all you've done is help people. He was despised and rejected by mankind, Isaiah says. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. See, the nation of Israel knew that they needed a savior. They knew that they needed rescue, but they had no idea how deep this need went. They didn't know. And so Jesus was not only misunderstood when he came as a servant, but we misunderstand his suffering for us when we undervalue the depths and pervasiveness of our sin. Because it exists in each one of us. Nothing less than the death of the Son of God can do it. Nothing less. And so being wounded for our transgressions and being bruised for our iniquities was the only way for God to destroy sin without destroying you. It was the only way. And so if we want to see Jesus as he truly is, we must know something about his service, about his suffering, and lastly, his strength. Now at this time, I'm going to have our worship team come back. We're going to respond in worship soon. Uh, and I'm also going to have our ushers uh, hand out candles. So everyone's going to get a candle. All right. And I'll explain what the candle is in a minute. All right. So don't let it distract you. Everyone's going to get a candle. All right. And so Jesus makes a comment. He says, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Then Jesus asks a question. He says, did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And then he gives them an explanation. It says in Luke 24, 27, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. All right. Now, Jesus uses the scriptures to show them 
this moment uh, that, that, that so discouraged them is actually in line with what God had planned all along. All right? And so I have no idea how Jesus did this, but if I were Jesus and I had to use the scriptures to reveal myself, this is how I would do it. Okay. This is how I would do it. And I, I learned this from uh, Tim Keller has a really good book on the resurrection, the meaning of Easter. You can find it there. But this is how I would explain myself if I were Jesus. Okay. I would start with the boys nobody chose. All right. The boys nobody chose. So if you open up the first pages of the Bible to the book of Genesis, you begin reading the narrative. One of the things you begin to see immediately uh, about the culture of its people and its tribes is what you could call the law of primogeniture. Right? They, they universally lived by this rule that the oldest son of the family was given nearly all the estate and wealth as parents aged and died. But what you also see is God offending and overturning that cultural value. All right, in every generation, God works not with the son. I already have one. Thank you. Thanks, brother. I have a few. I'm on fire up here. Okay. All right. So in every generation, God works not with the son that has the greatest cultural power and status, but he works with the younger sons. God chooses Abel over Cain. He chooses Isaac over Ishmael, Jacob over Esau, Joseph and Judah over Reuben. God chooses Joseph's younger son, Ephraim, over Manasseh. He chooses Moses over Aaron, even King David over his older brothers. Right? And not only were these boys younger brothers, but they were flawed men, and the Bible makes sure we know it. The right? Bible shows us that Jacob was a con man. The right? Bible shows us that Moses was a murderer and he had a speech impediment. The Bible tells us that, that, uh, that David was a murderer and an adulterer. All right, on and on and on, you see this about these younger sons. So God chooses the unchosen sons to display his power to transform even the most unpromising lives, right? The sons nobody chose. Secondly, I would tell them about the women nobody wanted because another dynamic that you will discover is that with women, the most beautiful and fertile of them receive the most favor, the most power, the most privilege and the most attention of the most powerful men in scripture. But again, we see God frustrating this process by working through the old and aged Sarah rather than the young Hagar. We see him working with the unattractive, the Bible calls weak-eyed Leah, right? Instead of stunningly beautiful Rachel. You see God working with barren women like Hannah and Samson's mother, doesn't he? That, that God chose Tamar and Rahab and Ruth and Bathsheba, all of who in the eyes of the cultural elites were morally, racially, and socially on the margins of society. Yet all four of them are the famous mothers of Jesus. They're all in his family tree. God chose them all. And so God used unwanted women to bring salvation to the world. From there, I would talk about the people everybody despised. In Revelation 7, the Bible tells us that in the end, God will have saved a great multitude from every nation, every tribe, every people, every language. But how will he do that? How, how will he do that? I mean, surely he knew that the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Greeks, the Romans would ascend to military and economic power, right? Of course, he's going to choose one of them to be his messengers, yeah? Why instead then? does he choose to reveal himself to Israel, a small nation of farmers and shepherds? Right? In the book of, of Deuteronomy, God tells the Israelites that he chose them not in spite of their powerlessness, but because of it. And he takes them into this land surrounded by nations much bigger and much stronger than all of them. And as long as they obeyed God, they did more than hold their own. They were feared in the land. But as they begin to stray, God sends prophets to warn them, but they don't listen. And so God sends, um, uh, God, God allows these other nations to come in and they're invaded, they're plundered, they're taken away in exile, and they become even weaker and they have to do all they can to maintain their faith and grow as a religious minority in foreign lands. But as the prophets predicted over centuries, 
as these more powerful nations fall and go extinct, this small scattered people are gathered back together on a small piece of land in the Middle East. Do you know that you can fit 448 Israels in the United States of America? Comparatively, is the size of New Jersey. It is small. It is very small, yet it has always been, and to this day, it still continues to be a powerful nation that is either loved or hated by every other nation in the world. Then there's a storyline that nobody wants to be in, right? We want the storyline of our lives to go from strength to strength, don't we? We want the storyline of our lives to go from success to success, happily ever after, right? But in Hebrews 11, the author reveals the pattern of how God works in our lives. And he names off patriarchs and tribal leaders and kings and prophets whose stories all have the same things in common. For all of them, and I love it, Hebrews 11:34 it says, their weakness was turned into strength. Their weakness, I mean, there's a, the, mo- the most famous people ever. Their weakness was turned into strength. Referring to us in the servant songs and fulfilled later by Jesus, Isaiah says, a bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out till he has brought justice through to victory. You and I are the bruised reed. You and I are the smoldering wick, the flickering flame. So even the most fragile among us, God says, I can use. I can use. And so if you feel weak today or Uh, If you're mature enough to know that though you feel strong and you look strong, you know how weak you really are. Or if your light's not shining. Or if you're holding on, you're doing all you can to keep your light from burning out. Jesus wants you to know that he wants to blow on the dying embers of your heart and bring life back into a flame for you. So we don't love that this is our story. We don't love that but we've got to be happy that we have a God who's here for it. Lastly, I would tell them about the gospel nobody wants to hear. I mean, think for a moment about the message that we preach. Think about this message. Jesus, although he was rich, for our sakes became poor. So that through his poverty, we might become rich. But see, the only way to become rich through his poverty is to admit that you are first poor, right? It's the only way. The first step to being rescued by God is an admission that you need to be rescued. The only way that you can be found is to understand that you are lost. And so acceptance of the gospel requires you to admit, uh, admit your weakness. If you're going to come to God, you have to admit your weakness. I mean, in its most blunt form, can I just tell you what the gospel says? In its most blunt form, the gospel tells you that you are a lost sinner who's done many wrongs. And even a lot of the right things you've done, you did out of your own self-interested motives. All of your strivings, even your religious ones, have been ways of putting God in a corner and getting him to meet your needs and to serve your interests. Everything you have is a gift from God and yet you're not loving him or living holy for him as you should. But if you repent, you can be saved, but only by the undeserved grace that God alone can offer you. That is the gospel that the New Testament teaches us, which is based on the the entire Old Testament and what it says about the character of God and human nature. And the more powerful you are, the more well off you are, the more uh, well put together you are, the more offensive that faith message is. And so if the whole Bible is about how God uses weakness, the sons nobody chose, the women nobody wanted, the people everybody despised, the storyline nobody wants to be in. 
and the gospel nobody wants to hear. If that's what the whole Bible is about, I got to believe that Jesus was telling these disciples that if this is what the Bible is about, then why wouldn't God use the perceived weakness of a servant suffering Messiah as the ultimate display of his strength? Why wouldn't God do that? See, to these discouraged disciples, Jesus made a comment. He asked a question and he gave an explanation. And all that shows us how we can see him as he truly is, that Jesus came as a servant. He came as a sufferer, but he also came in strength. Amen. Amen. Like in the story of Dr. William Leslie, God was more committed to his work than they thought. Let's stand together. Does everyone have their candle? Let me see your candle. I'm gonna have Aaron and Amy come join me. Don't hurt yourself, girl. If you fall, we're all gonna laugh, but then we're gonna pick you up, okay? I won't fall. All right, so fair warning, fair warning. Uh, in a moment, we're gonna turn all the lights out in this room, all right? If you're afraid of the dark, I'm pretty sure people in here won't steal money out of your pocket when the lights go off. I'm pretty sure. Can't trust a few. All right, got to still in question. All right, all right. So just stay still if you're afraid of the dark. Amen? You guys ready for this? I didn't test this out, so let's see if this is gonna work. All right, guys. This is the last message in a series that we've been calling Build the Hearth. And we've been in a season in life of our church where we believe God is telling us to prioritize the stewardship of his presence. And in order to build a fire that doesn't go out, we must make room and prepare a place of intentionality, right? But, but how do we do this when we're discouraged? Um, how do we do this when we're disappointed? How is this possible when we feel like a smoldering wick, a flickering flame that just is holding on in this dark world? The way to do this is to run to a savior who would never snuff your fire out and you also need to find others to burn with you, amen? If you have light and you have someone around you that doesn't, Go ahead and light their candle. See, if Christians are called to be like their Savior, if we're to be the saints who serve, if we're to be willing sufferers whose strength comes from weakness, then bruised reeds and flickering flames are a good picture of what we may look like to the world. Amen. So what do we do with our weakness? Right? How, how do we steward this flickering flame? We steward the flame by doing it together. See, it's important to note that this little light, look at your candle. It's important to note that this little light you have, maybe by itself it's not much. It's not, not much at all, but it's powerful enough to ignite someone else. 
The very heart of God for our community is for us to be children of the light that shine together because when we do this, we create an environment, look around, we create an environment where darkness cannot exist. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, it says, For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. Psalm 18 says, You, Lord, keep my lamp burning. My God turns my darkness into light. Psalm 112 says, Even in darkness, light dawns for the upright. And so may we never forget that we can only be called upright because Jesus took our wrongs upon himself and was struck down. The cross and resurrection is a great paradox. Christ saves us through weakness by giving up power and succumbing to a seeming defeat, but he triumphs. And not despite the weakness and loss of power, but because of it. Jesus chose weakness to display his strength. Jesus was bruised to make you whole. Jesus' fire was snuffed out to set you ablaze. Jesus is calling. And so are you discouraged today? Did you come here disappointed about what you thought God was going to do but didn't do? Because God is more committed to completing the work he began in you than you think. And for those of you who are running from God, God is so good that even in your running, you will find that he will save you on the very road you took to avoid him. Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. Jesus came to give us the right perspective of who he really is. He has come with his spirit to blow on our wicks, to give new strength in the flame of our lives. Amen. We can turn the lights back on. Together with me, will you blow your candle out? There's nothing symbolic about this. I just don't want you to burn the building down. Okay. <laughs> don't want you to burn the building down. So as I just wrap up here, Jesus makes a comment. He asks a question and he gives an explanation. And as the disciples approached the village they were headed to, they still don't know that he's Jesus. They still don't know he's Jesus, but they ask him to come in and eat with them. So the way this story ends, is they finish this conversation and the disciples get to the village that they were headed to. And as they head into this village, It says that this mysterious man continued on like he was gonna keep going. But they asked him to come in. They asked him to come inside. And once Jesus came inside, they still didn't know who he was. Jesus took the bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it to share it with them. And the Bible says that their eyes were open and they recognized him and that he disappeared from their sight. And then after this, they looked at each other and one of them said, man, when he was talking to us, I just felt this heat in my chest, like it was burning. And the other disciple was like, word, same. That happened to me too. And I think there's something here for us because what I want you to see is that if you were here today and you would say, Sean, I'm not a believer. I'm not a Christian. I don't have a relationship with Jesus, but I'm intrigued. I want you to know that Jesus is not discouraged by your questions or your doubt. He's not. 
And I think these disciples have the key because they did two things. And if you do these two things, I believe you'll see him too. They invited him in and they broke bread with him. They invited him in and they broke bread with him. The passage says that they urged him strongly, stay with us. They literally invited him into their home. And so the question for you is, will you invite him in? In the book of Revelations, it says that Jesus stands at the door and he knocks. And if anyone hears his voice and opens the door, he will come in. And I love how the NLT version says this. It says that we will share a meal together as friends. They invited him in, but later admitted to each other that their hearts burned, which is to say that they knew in their hearts before they knew in their heads. They knew it in their hearts. They didn't know who this mysterious man was, but they knew there was something about him. There was something about him. And so they invited him in. There was something about this guy and they just couldn't let him go. And so this is what I want to say. Will you invite him in today? Don't let him go. And then it says that they broke bread with him. Now, what does that mean? I believe it means that they committed to fellowship and worship even though they didn't have it all figured out. And let me just tell you, if you're here today and you don't have Jesus figured out, you're in great company. Okay? No one here has Jesus figured out. None of us. But if you stay and if you commit to showing up and breaking bread with his people like these disciples, I'm confident that your eyes will be open and you too will recognize the real Jesus. Amen. 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 So with all heads bowed and all eyes closed, I'd be remiss if I didn't just take a moment. The kids are out there going stir crazy. They want their eggs and the goodies. But if you're here today and you would say, Sean, I know I need Jesus. I came in here and I had a view of God, I had a view of church, I had a view of who Jesus is. And I really want to see him. And this invitation is for those of you in the room, you've never done this. You've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. But today, you would say, Sean, I know I want this. Just slip your hand up. We just want to pray for you. I see you, brother. Anyone else? We have one. We have another one over here. I'll wait for you. anyone else I was listening to a, a song this morning that broke me and the lyrics in the song if I can find it quick in the lyrics of the song he said I can't believe that I thought so many times I was done but you're the type of person to leave the 99 for the one you're here today you're the one Slip your hand up. This is my last call. Amen. Amen. I see you. I see you. Father, we thank you for your precious son. God, we thank you that he would leave heaven, come to earth, he would live a perfect life. That he would be misunderstood by his closest friends, his family even. And that he would go to a cross completely condemned, an innocent man. But he went there for all of us. He died there. And they buried him. You can't keep a good man down. You can't keep a good man down. 
Thank you, God, that he rose from the grave. And at the resurrection, we can all cheer because that means that the check cleared. Thank you, Jesus, that you rose. And because of that, we can rise with you. Or for those in the room that are for the first time making a decision to give their lives to you. God, I ask that you would just come right now into their lives, into their hearts. Testify, Spirit, that you are theirs and they are yours. And as they are asking for forgiveness for their sin, as they are repenting for their sin, God, would you dwell richly in them from now on and forevermore. We thank you, Jesus, that you bought that for us. We praise you, God. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Amen.